Luke chapter 5, verse number 1 says, So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Lunch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Verse number four says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, lunch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. Would you do me a favor and touch somebody beside you and tell them it's worth another try? That's what I want to preach about. It's worth another try. It's worth, it's worth another try. It's worth another try. <laughs> the journey of life does not always happen the way we might expect it. Without caution, unexpected events and changes and circumstances interrupt our lives, forcing us to adjust and do what we hadn't planned. Because sometimes, although interruptions are frustrating, they are inevitable. They are a common part of life. Nothing sets you back on the path of productivity and robs you of vitality like the challenging impact of interruptions. Despite common misconceptions, church, interruptions serve a crucial purpose. They serve a crucial purpose by preventing us from becoming complacent and approaching familiar tasks haphazardly. Frequently, there are times when interruptions come in our lives that we mistakenly interpret interruptions as indicators to change our course, rather than recognizing them as natural deviations and adjusting appropriately to maintain effectiveness. Such is the case of the focal text before us. Simon Peter is one of the central characters of the text. He and his other colleagues have just encountered an unsuccessful night of fishing. They're feeling disheartened and weary with no tangible results to display for their efforts. And here they are, they are tidying their nets, winding down and readying themselves to depart. And right in the midst of their disappointment, Jesus appears accompanied by a sizable crowd that has been drawn to him. When he shows up, church, he requests for Simon's boat to serve as a floating pulpit so that he could create some distance between himself and the crowd for better communication. If you like me, when I read this, it seemed somewhat intrusive considering the timing that Jesus shows up. It's in a moment of disappointment, and Jesus shows up asking to use something from people who have already met a moment of frustration. But Simon, the Bible says, he obliged his request, perhaps, it is his willingness that is fueled by his admiration for Jesus. You remember in the chapter before, he had recently listened attentively to the preaching of Jesus in Capernaum. And he had witnessed the miraculous healing of his mother-in-law and so many others at the hands of the miracle-working Messiah. As for what Jesus conveyed to the crowd, that remains unknown because Luke actually wants to direct our attention to this conversation with Simon about his fishing endeavors. It's impressive to me, church, as he illustrates what this particular account illustrates Jesus' principle 
of never subtracting from our lives without offering something in return. I think that's good for us to know that even if he takes something away that you never expected to lose, he can always replace it with something you never expected to have. Did you catch that? Let me say it to you again. Th this illustrates the principle of our Christ that he never subtracts from your life without offering or giving something in return. Because if he takes away something you never expected to lose, he can replace it with something you never expected to have. Maybe this is what the forefathers meant when they sang songs like, you can't beat God's giving. The more you give, the more he gives back to you. And here it is at the time of this text, he gives an uncommon solution to their usual way of doing things. Notice the Bible says he has now shown up and he asked Simon to use his boat so that he could put some distance in between himself and the crowd. And then after he finishes speaking to the crowd, he turns his angle of thought now to Simon and he instructs him to put out into the deep. That's interesting, church, because what that literally means is he gives the instructions for them to go beyond the comfortable, to go beyond the normal, to go beyond the convenient. And with a fresh and costly obedience, they should renew their enthusiasm. Now, from the onset, when we read this, it seems as if Simon is refusing to obey because the futile exercise size of the past has developed a closed mindset and he doesn't expect a positive result but might I submit to you church that closed mindedness is detrimental to embracing alternative solutions and failing to be open minded obstructs life's progress in various ways you didn't catch that let me flip it one more time and said this way, until our minds are unlocked, we will never be able to grasp the provisions that God has for us because we don't see the possibilities that are the results of different perspectives and different ideas. I'm talking to someone right now that the problem with your closed mindedness is that you don't think God can do anything different in the same place you've already been in. But here's the lesson today, and I'll say a few more things and I'll take my seat. This is what I want you to know. Here's my textual observation that faith and commitment are challenged and developed by requests that are beyond us. Did you catch that? Let me say it to you again. Faith and commitment are challenged and developed by requests that are beyond us. Let me flip the coin on his head and give you a portable truth to take it home with you. Accept the reality that God doesn't consider our comfort, but he measures our complete obedience. He doesn't consider your comfort, but he measures your complete obedience obedience that while you're concerned about comfort he's more concerned about your character <laughs> Simon is a professional and because he's a professional when he hears these words from Jesus it is the aggravation that is heard in his response master we have toiled all night Master, we've told you all night, and uh, in case you didn't know it, Jesus, we've already tried that, and there's nothing here. Let me tell you, church, the problem with closed-minded people is, is that while they are closed-minded, their mouth is always open. 
The truth of the matter is, whenever you are closed-minded but always open-mouthed, you become limited in knowledge about matters, and you can never allow your opinion to be the dominating factor. He says, Master, we've already tried that. Wait a minute. Did you catch it? When Jesus shows up, it is now daytime. <laughs> Come on, track along with me. When, when he shows up, it is now daytime. And he tells them to lunch out into the deep. But he tells them to do it at a time that was not the normal schedule for fishermen. Mm -hmm. They actually fished at night. You have a studious pastor. You've ran across this scriptural neighborhood at some point. But I just want to lift it up for re-emphasizing to your, to your thoughts that, that, that they are instructed to do this in the daytime. They fished at night because seemingly the fish were more captivating at night. They fished at night because the fish couldn't see the net like that of the day. And the response is literally, if we didn't catch anything all night, Catching something now is impossible. But wait a minute, church. He tells them to lunch out into the deep because he's already aware of the failed attempt. But he also knew the destiny he was trying to push them into. And maybe God is calling you to do it again because he wants you to see that a risk with him is a reward for you. Okay, um, uh, so sometimes, sometimes our lives have to be jolted or shaken up by circumstances just for us to accept the fact that no matter how good you are at something, challenging times will appear. And you have to be vulnerable enough to know that even at strange times, the good advice comes. Stretched. Let me let me flip it for you to write it down because I like I like you. That, that, that strange advice always comes at difficult times. Strange advice always comes at difficult times. That there are many times in life when you are embarrassed to have to accept advice about something you know how to do. Like. Like, like nobody in your estimation has any room to tell you how to do what you know how to do. That's the audacity of Jesus to show up and give fishing advice to professionals. These men didn't fish for leisure. They did this for lifestyle. They didn't fish for pleasure. They fished for profit. And Jesus, a carpenter, shows up to give strange advice at a difficult time. Because Jesus had never fished before, just not in that water. <laughs> Strange advice comes at difficult times, which then leads me to tell you, church, that you got to be willing and open to receive strange advice at difficult times, but I also need to tell you, you ought to cease taking advice from people who don't have your vested interests. <laughs> At heart. Because here's the truth. The Lord is actually trying to teach them a much needed lesson. That while it is that their closed mindedness has caused them to give up on the moment. He's trying to teach them this lesson that he can never use you on your own terms. I know this is not you. I pastor your cousins in Detroit. So let me tell you. That some of us are only obedient 
when it's convenient for us. Because you do know there are a lot of convenient-based Christians. Charles Stanley says on one occasion that too many Christians commit based on convenience. They stay faithful as long as it's safe and doesn't involve risk, rejection, or criticism. And instead of them sometimes standing alone in the face of challenge or temptation, they always check to see which way their friends are going first. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Too many Christians commit based on convenience. And they stay faithful as long as it's safe and doesn't involve risk, rejection, or criticism. And instead of them standing alone in the face of challenge or temptation, they always check to see which way their friends are going first because they are convenient-based. You know, there are people who don't serve unless it's convenient for them. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your cousins I passed in Detroit. Just, just listen to me. There, there, there are people who serve based on convenience. That if my name is not mentioned, then that's not the area I choose to be in. <laughs> and, and, and Simon says, you know, we've already tried that, but uh, nevertheless, at your word, I'll go and do it. I got a question, Buck. I got a question. Is he humoring or honoring Jesus? I want to know, is he humoring Jesus or is he honoring Jesus? Or, Ian, is he weary beyond the point of caring? Listen to me, church. Because as a seasonal fisherman, he knew that in the daytime, the fish moved to the bottom of the lake when the sun was up. Is he humoring Jesus or is he honoring Jesus? Because he also knew this, listen to me church, that the drag nets that they used could not go deep enough to catch those fish. God Almighty. Because what you must understand is that they were fishing or they fished, I should say, with surface nets. And the truth of the matter is, church, is that sometimes your greatest catch is being held hostage at the expense of your surface comfort. I'm trying to talk to somebody in this room because sometimes he'll call you back to the same place where you failed because you got to learn how to not operate in comfort because too many people operate in comfort but still have expectations of God doing that which is not ordinary. Is he humoring him or is he honoring him because he knows that they are fishing with surface nets? And maybe church, maybe church, you'll never have a deep water testimony because you're complacent sticking by the shore. Who am I talking to in this room? I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe you will never go deeper in God because surface is your place of comfort. And notice what Christ does. He calls them back to the place where failure occurred. No, no doubt there are many people who've had the mind to do right, but the will to carry it out was not there. And there's so many people who have failed to execute the plan because of their comfortability. We feel like if we try a different method and fail, then we start asking the question, what is it, what is it to do next? But he calls them back to where they failed. Don't miss this, church. He calls them back to where they failed. He does not instruct them to go to another lake. He does not instruct them to change their bait. He doesn't tell them back, back in, the, in, the, in, the, in the vernacular of, 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 of my hometown, Memphis, you know, when they would give instructions, it goes a little something like this. He never told them, go down that street, make a left. If you pass the house with the two pit bulls, you've gone too far. No. He, 
he, he, he just tells them to launch out further in the lake they were already in. He doesn't tell them to change bait, doesn't tell them to change the lake. Launch out further in the lake you're already in. Can I submit to you, Antioch, that the distance between your miracle catch is your obedience to his command? Can I say it another way? The truth is, your rise will always be in the context of controversy. Come here, this is what I'm trying to tell you. Disappointment and destiny can be on the same lake. Okay. I'm going to quit. That, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Disappointment and destiny can be on the same lake. All right, here's your part that you can shout on. The greater your disappointment, the greater your destiny. Okay, disappointment is needed for you to appreciate destiny. I don't know about you, but when I look back over my life, I'm thankful for the stuff that has happened that was birthed out of disappointment. Because it's the stuff that was birthed out of disappointment that made me appreciate it more. God, I wish I had company in this church. Because the truth of the matter is, the stuff we get too easy, we don't appreciate it like we should because we feel if we lose it, we'll get it again. But somebody in this room knows what it feels like to have disappointment and destiny to be in the same place. That if it had not been for the disappointment, I wouldn't be able to appreciate what God is trying to do in my life right now. Simon with a tone of doubt and unbelief. I'm time, I'm, time is running. Simon with, Simon with a tone of doubt and unbelief. He doesn't go along with it. He's really not expecting anything different to happen in the same water. But he's trusting the word of the Lord. And at the risk of being talked about, he says, I'm going for it. This is interesting, church, because he's willing to give it another try. Conditions may be dark, the world may fight against us, and our fears will nearly submerge us, but we have to have a nevertheless. But allow me to offer this thought, church. I want to raise a little tension here for you because I want to offer that you have to be mindful of this reality. That even when you fail or try and fail, you have to be okay with the fact that it's not the Lord's will for us to come out or succeed all the time. Ultimately, it's God's prerogative. In some cases, he doesn't will for us to succeed. He just wants us to try. And sometimes you got to try and fail so that you can have experiences with what failing feels like. Okay, I, 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 know, I know that's the tension of this because this is what I'm trying to tell you, church. Failure is not a person, it's an event. I know, I know you've been told that you are a failure. You, you just like your old... <laughs> I know you've heard that, but let me tell you, church, that failure is an event and not a person. So there's nothing wrong with having moments of failure as long as you make the decision not to stay in the moment. Okay. Um, um, sometimes he doesn't will for us to succeed. He just wants us to try. It is Larry Crabb in his book, The Pressure's Off. He says that God is not a vending machine. He's not a God that just dispenses blessings as rewards for our good behavior. But we need to reject a faith that is filled with a formula that says, if I do A, then God automatically got to do B for me. 
Listen, church, nevertheless was not faith, but it was really obedience. Because can I submit to you that faith and obedience do not wait for favorable circumstances. If it did, there would be no need for faith and obedience. The truth is, sometimes our personal insistence for clarity can hinder our obedience. Did you catch that? Let me say it to you again. Sometimes our personal insistence for clarity can hinder our obedience. And sometimes we allow our confusion about the instruction to serve as an excuse for disobedience. Can I just ask you something? I'm pressing. Have you ever been shown something by God at a point in your life that didn't make sense at the time? But you found out later when the revelation was revealed that God was preparing you for something in your life that at the time it didn't make sense to you. But did not know God was trying to get you to a point where he could use you in a greater capacity. That's what's happening here. Sometimes in order for you to be a blessing, you got to go through your own brokenness. So, so, sometimes in order for you to actually see what God is trying to do behind the scene of this season, is you got to go through moments where... You obey him even when you don't understand. Can I tell you, church, that this was obedience more than faith because your obedience and faith are not, listen to me, they are not in direct correlation. Listen, church, you don't have to have faith to obey. But your obedience will develop your faith. When you obey... It'll cause you to do stuff out of the ordinary. And the only answer you will have for your actions is, God told me to do it. Can I talk to somebody? Can I put a card in the meter and say a little bit more and I'm done? But can I talk to you and ask you, have you ever been there where you didn't really have your faith on display? But you just did it because you heard the Lord say do it. People been looking at you strange. You, you think you ought to go back to school at this age? You think you ought to open up that business? You ain't never had good credit to open up nothing. You, you think you but, but But sometimes it's not my faith. It's my obedience. And regardless to how crazy or strange it makes me look to my context, all I got is God told me. I'm talking to somebody right now, you've been looking at the facts of your life and you have not observed the fact that God knows the facts. God is interested in your obedience. That sometimes I don't have to know all of the details, but even with my obedience, I come to God with a disposition that says, I don't know what you're going to do, but I believe you're going to do something. I'm almost done, but can you just nudge somebody and tell them, neighbor, if I had time, I'd tell you my whole story. But just believe me when I tell you, I got stuff in my life right now. I don't know how I got it. I just did it because God told me to do it. Come on, talk to somebody. Tell them, I got a degree right now. I didn't have all of the money for it. I didn't qualify for any financial aid because my, I mean, everything was just jacked up. But you walked across stage and you're now working where you wanted to work. You can't explain it. You just did it because God told you to. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. Nevertheless, I don't go along with it. I already been out here before, God. You remember the last time you got me out there? I know you're saved and you don't talk like that, but I'm, I, I got a relationship with him, right, that, that, that we can talk. You know, you know, people say, you ought not question God. Well, last time I checked on Calvary, the answer had a question. 
Why have you forsaken me? And if the answer can ask a question, there are moments in my life where I can ask a question. Why are you doing me like this, God? Why you got me out here? But, but nevertheless, nevertheless, at your word, Wait a minute. I got to quit. Here it is. He acquiesces to the command, but he acquiesces to the command. He complies to the command with the intent of proving Christ wrong. When he gets through talking to the crowd, he looks at him and says, hey, lunch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. Verse number five says, Peter said, man, I don't go along with this, but... I'm going to let down a net. Listen, church. Let down your nets for a catch. Peter said, hey, 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 man. If you think I'm going to go back over there and unravel all of them nets. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what, though. I will obey but I'll partially obey. And the text says he let down a net. Now, we don't know if he was getting ready to put more nets in. But what we do know is by the time he dropped the one net, What Christ had intended for him started running to what he... Can I say this, church? He possibly dropped the number of nets that represented his expectations. And I want to tell you that you can't doubt his power because your expectations are limited. Can I suggest that what you drop in this next season of your life is an indication of what you expect to receive? And you got to decide if you want just enough to be your portion or more than enough. And God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Can I submit to somebody that the opportunities in your future are too important for you to just wing it. Because there's no quick way to purpose. Hasty shortcuts are the fashion of the day. The immediate gratification is today's thing. And the do it quick approach has been adopted. And such an approach has always led people to a moment of poverty. Simon said, man, you want us to do this. And these people out here watching us, we've already been embarrassed because we never imagined having a moment like this. And now you want us to drop our nets. I'll drop it. But I'm still concerned about how this is going to turn out. Simon removed his flesh so that God could move and like he chose to move. Can I tell you, church, you'll never follow Christ to his fullest extent until you become more concerned about what he thinks about you than what others think about you. Maybe you're still at the surface because you're concerned about the commentary of people. When Christ has something he intends for you to do. Bible says when they obeyed his commands. Thank you, Antioch. Thank you, Pastor Wesley. He'll watch it later or not. Just tell him I said thank you. We'll talk in the days to come. You, when, when you obey his commands, the Bible says they caught a mass of fish. Because success comes by simple obedience. The Bible says that their nets began to break or was about to to break which means church if their nets had actually broken 
as our English language supposed, then that means the fish would have escaped the net. But what's meant is that their nets were at the point of being rent asunder. Here's where I want to sign off by saying the fish were in the water the night before. Peter just didn't know how to find them. Yeah, but uh, the Lord wanted to teach him what could happen if he would just obey his word. Have a good day, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good. But uh, that's why I'm standing today because I've been singing that song that the saints of my childhood would sing right along through here. Lord lead me guide me along the way do y'all still sing that around here for if you need me I cannot stray Lord let me walk each day with thee Lord lead me guide me I'm going all the way would you touch a neighbor now and tell them neighbor I don't know about you but I'm going somewhere with God have I got a witness here tell somebody near you I don't care what it looks like I'm going somewhere with God have I got a witness here would you touch a neighbor I'm through with y'all now but would you touch a neighbor and tell a neighbor I'll trust in God wherever I may be out on the lane or on the raging sea the billows may roll my heavenly father he keeps my soul and he watches over me do I have a witness here that can lift your hand and shout I'm going with God as a matter of fact I feel I feel my nets breaking have I got a witness here? Do I have anybody who can help me close now and slip your hand in somebody's hand and tell them, neighbor, I don't know what it is, but you ought to try it again. I don't know how long that moment was, but oh, you ought to try it again. Have I got a witness here? And I just believe if you try it with him, everything. I'm done, but just tell somebody if you try it with him, everything. It's going to be all right. Do you believe it today? How can I say thanks for the things you've done for me? Things so undeserving, yet you proved your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude for all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all, I owe it all to be to God. Be the glory to God. Be the glory to God. Be the glory for the things he has done. Anybody want to give him praise? Anybody want to give him praise? Somebody to God be the glory. Turn around and tell somebody to God be the glory for the things he's done and 
if I should gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. Anybody want to give my God some praise? Open up your mouth and praise him. Ah, try it. I'm done, but go touch about three people and tell them, try it again. Tell them, be not dismayed. Whatever be time, God will, God will, God will. Won't he take care of you? Shout if you believe it. Open up your mouth like you know it. Somebody, I won't be like this always. Turn and tell somebody, I won't be like this always. Talk to them, tell them the next time you see me, I won't be like this always. But I'm with God. Are you on your way? Shout yes. Shout yes. Yeah. Yeah. My time is up, but just look at somebody and tell Dry your weeping eyes. Look at somebody back there and tell them, dry your weeping eyes. Talk somebody and tell them, your miracle is on the way. And if I was you, I wouldn't wait till it's over. But I throw my head back, lift up my hands, and shout. Anybody want to praise my God? Touch somebody and tell them, I see you in your future. And you look a whole lot better. Your family is being blessed. Your marriage is being blessed. Your job is being blessed. Your children is being kept. Your body is being healed. Yeah. Lord, my soul done got happy. Do me a favor one time and just spin around one time. Look at somebody and tell them I just spin around into another blessing. And if you don't watch me, Make the devil mad Cause I see God doing something for me Lift your hands and shout do it for me It's me oh Lord I'm standing in the need of prayer Look at somebody and ask them do you feel Like I feel Ask do you feel like I feel? Ask them, how do you feel? Come on, ask them, how do you feel? I got a feeling everything gonna be all right. I'm trying it again. Come what may, day to day. Yeah.
and tell somebody, go do it again. Look at somebody and tell them, go do it again. Tell them, I don't know what it is, but go do it again. Tell them, do it with God. Do it with God. Do it with God. That's how we leave it. Do it with God. Do it with God. God shout like you believe it shout like you're going pray 